This video has been made possible by Brilliant, a problem solving based website and app with a hands on approach. Improve your STEM skills while having a great time learning at brilliant.org forward slash visualpoliticen. More on this in a bit. North Korea is back to its old tricks. North Korea fires ballistic missile over Japan. Projectile's 4,600 km flight potentially puts US territory of Guam within Pyongyang's range. Within less than a month, the old-fashioned communist country of Juche ideology has decided to resume massive testing of its ballistic missile program by firing missiles over Japan, and even more tauntingly, south of the South Korean maritime border for the first time in history. What's more, North Korea has launched more than 20 missiles in a single day, representing one of the biggest escalations which happened to coincide with the massive vigilance storm joint drill between South Korea and the US involving over 240 aircraft. We can even say that the love affair that arose after the summits between Kim Jong-un, Trump and former South Korean President Moon Jae-in has definitely come to an end. Of course, this is not the first time Pyongyang has conducted very provocative tests. What has happened over the last month is definitely on the next level. To give you an example, in 2017, the North Korean regime also launched two ballistic missiles that flew over Japan and triggered missile alarms and alerts to evacuate to bomb shelters. Those of you who are part of our Patreon community surely already know some details about the North Korean ballistic launch over Japan, basically because we told you about it in our bulletin, the weekly snapshot. But for those of you who are not yet part of Visual Politics Patreon community, let me summarize. On the 3rd of October 2022, Pyongyang decided to launch an intermediate range missile, believed to be one of the Hwasong-12 type, into the Pacific Ocean. Beyond the military issue, the fact is that the launch over Japan and the missile which landed in South Korean waters had, above all, a political reading. With it, Kim Jong-un made it clear that the time for dialogue was over and that he is now ready to return his country to a kind of military autarky known as the Songun Doctrine. That is, the military comes first. This is a major game changer. Of course, the North Koreans will lose out again because they will suffer a new setback in life. But the return of the Songun Doctrine also marks the return of the policy of direct and permanent confrontation with South Korea, Japan and the United States. In addition, the latest ballistic test over Japan had somewhat different characteristics than usual. This time, the launch was much more horizontal and at a lower altitude. Specifically, and according to data confirmed by South Korea, the North Korean missile launched on 3rd of October flew a horizontal distance of 4,600 kilometers or 2,858 miles, exceeded 950 kilometers, that's 590 miles in altitude, and reached a speed of Mach 17, that is, 17 times the speed of sound. And while it's unclear what speed it could register in real war conditions and loaded with the weight of explosive warheads, the test data puts it close to becoming a hypersonic weapon. In addition, for the first time, North Korea has demonstrated beyond any doubt that they would be capable of attacking the island of Guam, which belongs to the United States of America. And take note because this island is a key place for the military projection of the US Army in the Asia Pacific region. Large quantities of military equipment are stationed on Guam and it is even believed that it could harbor nuclear weapons. And now it is in Pyongyang's crosshairs because never before has the North Korean regime successfully launched a ballistic missile so far. And that has caused us to ask a few questions. How advanced is the North Korean ballistic program really? What capabilities would it really have in the event of a war? What change does this new capability mean for the balance of power in the region? Well, we're going to take a look at that right now. But before we continue, whether you're trying to develop your professional skills or broaden your understanding of the world, we recommend checking out today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem-solving based website and app with a hands-on approach. That's a better way to learn. They've got over 70 interactive courses in maths, science, and computer science. And it doesn't matter whether you're a student looking to get ahead or a professional keen on building new skills, you have to check out Brilliant. It's excellent. Maybe you've always wanted to learn about algebra. Well, stay tuned because they have just released a new course, Introduction to Algebra, where you'll be able to explore the twin pillars of algebraic thinking, equations, and graphs. Brilliant will help you unpack algebra's main ideas and develop a powerful perspective for solving its essential problems. There's loads of great stuff on their platform, which include daily challenges, which are a great flex to our gray matter every day. So don't wait any longer and let Brilliant help you master even complex technical subjects by clicking on the link below. You'll get started for free and hurry because the first 200 people get 20% off an annual premium subscription. High Flying Deterrent 
North Korea, or rather Kim Jong-un's regime, is absolutely clear about one thing. They do not want to become the new Libya. In fact, it is not uncommon for him to hold up to the latter country as an example of the mistake that abandoning the nuclear program can entail. Libya did so in 2003, and by 2011, Gaddafi was dead. Naturally, Kim Jong-un does not want to suffer the same fate. And the truth is that this approach is entirely logical. If you are an unscrupulous dictator and you don't give a damn about people's lives, then nuclear weapons are your best life insurance. In Pyongyang offices, behind closed doors, it is very clear to them that their rudimentary combat forces compete in different galaxies from those of South Korea, let alone the United States. The technological evolution of recent decades has left them completely out of the game. Precisely for this reason, for more than 20 years, North Korea's defense plans have only taken into account one premise, to increase the cost of a foreign military intervention in the country. In other words, it is not a matter of being able to repel an attack, but of the cost being so high that no one is willing to pay that price. It is the policy of deterrence taking to its highest level. And that is exactly where nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles fit in. And the further those weapons can go, the greater their deterrent capability and therefore their life insurance. The Kims want to make their nuclear weapons capable of directly attacking the United States. In their view, this would strengthen their political clout and make them completely untouchable. And that is why once nuclear weapons have been developed, the next step in the whole military strategy is precisely the development of an effective ballistic missile system and also the development of shorter range and more accurate missiles capable of reaching US bases in Okinawa, Hawaii and Guam. In this way, the North Koreans ensure that a possible regime change does not enter into Washington's plans, especially if they are unpredictable, irritable, and impulsive with all that force. It would be something similar to a rabid dog strategy. To put it simply, don't come closer, I will bite. Yes, in a way, I think that would be a good way to sum up Pyongyang's perverse game. But okay, this is all quite logical and nothing new. But the question I'm sure many of you are asking is, but let's see, Josh, North Korea is a very poor and technologically a very backward country. How on earth is it possible that it has managed to develop such advanced nuclear weapons and missiles. Flying 4,600 kilometers and reaching Mach 17 is not exactly child's play. Well, the fact is that North Korea is a very poor country, but it is also a country with a single obsession. So it is estimated that the government allocates between 20 and 30% of all national resources to the military every year. And it is the only country in the world in that range. In other words, North Korean production basically feeds two things, subsistence and military. According to South Korean estimates, we're talking about an annual investment in its armed forces of between seven and $11 billion. But of course, there are several things to take into account here. Spending on salaries is minuscule. To give you an idea, the four-star generals receive somewhere between a little more than $1,000 a month from the government, corrupt practices aside. And if we're talking about the professional troops, it is believed that salaries range between $10 and $40 a month. And those in compulsory military service do not even reach that. So unlike other armies, let's just say that manpower is a much smaller consumption of resources. This allows them to free up a large part of their available resources for their two absolute priority objectives, border defenses and strategic armaments. That is nuclear bombs and ballistic missiles. In North Korea, you're not going to see modern combat weaponry, advanced artillery, high-tech tanks, or a large combat air fleet. They have understood perfectly well that in all those fields, they cannot compete. On the other hand, surprising as it may seem to you, the truth is that it is incredibly cheap to develop nuclear weapons. The reason more countries do not have this weaponry is largely because of the commitment to non-proliferation and not due to cost or technology. Let me explain. According to South Korean government estimates made in 2016, the North Korean nuclear weapons program may have cost between $1.1 billion and $3.2 billion. And yes, that figure may have increased somewhat by 2022, but roughly speaking, it's not going to amount to much more than that. So even a country as poor as North Korea can afford it. What's more, South Korean and US intelligence believe that both the ballistic and nuclear programs have been largely financed by hackers, cryptocurrencies, and illegal trafficking. For example, it is known, and it is even reported by the United Nations, that in order to obtain foreign currency in recent years, the North Korean regime has systematized its operations of smuggling, drug trafficking, and the sale of military equipment to poor countries, countries under sanctions, and paramilitary groups. This is an issue that we talked about some time ago here on Visual Politic, and that explains to a large extent why economic sanctions have not been able to stop the development of these programs. In fact, it is relatively well known that the North Koreans have even created clandestine arms production 
production networks in various parts of Africa to supply disreputable warlords and governments. North Korea's surprising lucrative relationship with Africa. Nambia had contracted with a North Korean company called Mansude Overseas Projects to build a munitions factory as well as a new military academy. Filmmaker spends 10 years secretly recording North Korea's shady dealings. Leveraging hidden cameras, the film shares illegal triangle trade deals to smuggle Russian oil into the DPRK, North Korea, underground arms factories on a private Ugandan island, and sales meetings on North Koreans' weapons initially intended for Syria. And this is just a couple of examples of all these activities. But beyond the economic issues, let's move on to what you probably most want to know about. What on earth is it like? And what does the North Korean ballistic program entail? Well, let's take a look. One all-risk policy. The facts speak for themselves. Since it launched its ballistic technology development program back in the late 1980s and early 1990s, North Korea has made significant progress. And not surprisingly, it has based its first missiles on Soviet technology. The vast majority of North Korean short-range missiles are improved developments of those known in NATO nomenclature as SCUDs. Along these lines, the first North Korean missile was developed from the Soviet R-17 Elbrus, or SCUD-B. So both the liquid propellant engines and the guidance system of short-range missiles are derived from Russian technology. This is, for example, the case with the Hwasong 5, 6, and 7 missiles, some of which have even been exported to countries such as Iran. The problem is that Scud missile technology has limitations. So if the North Koreans wanted more powerful missiles with longer range, they needed more efficient and rugged engines capable of functioning at extreme altitudes and freezing temperatures. Therefore, in 1999, the communist country officially established the so-called strategic forces of the Korean People's Army. And since then, the ballistic missile has taken a 180 degree turn. Since the late 1990s and early 2000s, Pyongyang has devoted all of its efforts to creating a new family of missiles with indigenous technology, with more efficient engines and greater thrust. A new family that has resulted in a catalog with five types of missiles, one for each occasion, submarine launched, short range, medium range, intermediate range, and the dreaded intercontinental missiles. In theory, this program has put the communist country on a par with the major military powers in terms of ballistic capabilities and strategic weapons eventually capable of delivering nuclear warheads thousands of miles away. And along with missiles, North Korea is known so far to have succeeded in building nuclear weapons of between 15 and 20 kilotons, similar to those that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. In the nuclear weapons industry, this is equivalent to something like a 1950s car. But remember, we're talking about nuclear weapons. As long as they go, they can do more than enough damage. One thing the North Koreans are still believed not to have achieved is to miniaturize these weapons in order to be able to deliver them with the missiles we have discussed. Because basically, the nuclear program and the ballistic program are one and the same. Having said that, the next step is to know exactly how this program is structured. Well, the fact is that this new strategic force is classified, distributed, and organized according to the objective. In this way, leaving aside the Scud-type missiles and focusing only on the most modern and indigenous technology missiles, we could make the following classification. On the one hand, North Korea has a new missile capable of attacking with relative precision at any point in South Korea. We're talking about the KN-23 missile. The KN-23 is a solid fuel missile that has been tested several times since 2019. It could be launched from trains, trucks, or even submarines. And together with these missiles you see on the screen, this would be the third type of missile that North Korea could launch from a submarine. It has a proven range of 430 kilometers, or 267 miles. And it is believed that launched with a depressed trajectory, that is, with a flatter launch, less payload, and lower altitude, it could evade many of the anti-missile defense systems, such as the American THAAD. Surprising, isn't it? Well, that's just the beginning. The next two steps in the range, the medium and intermediate range missiles, are where North Korea has put special efforts over the last decade. Why? Well, it's simple. Because medium and intermediate range missiles are the missiles that allow Pyongyang to keep within range of Japan and Guam, two places where the United States has permanently stationed some of its most advanced strategic weapons. And believe me when I say that from a strategic point of view, Pyongyang's deterrent power of having missiles capable of reaching these places is more than remarkable. 
We're talking about missiles such as the Musudan and the Hwasong-12, which are estimated to have a range of up to 4,000 and 4,500 kilometers, respectively. To put this into perspective, the island of Guam is less than 3,500 kilometers away from the communist country as the crow flies. In both cases, these missiles are prepared to carry nuclear warheads, and if North Korea succeeds in miniaturizing its nuclear weapons to the point of being able to deliver them on such missiles, this would mean that a North Korean nuclear strike against US bases would be a real possibility. However, although these missiles are two of the means of attack that most concern the United States because of the targets they could reach, the truth is that if we read the Western press, we will quickly see that the ones that are really concerning are another group entirely. Of course, I'm referring to intercontinental missiles. These missiles are the ones that could take this whole issue to the next level, evidently because we're talking about missiles with nuclear payloads that could reach both Europe and their continental United States itself. <laughs> We are especially talking about two key missiles, the Hwasong-14 and the Hwasong-15. And take note because South Korean intelligence considers the former to be fully operational, that is, ready for use. It is a two-stage missile that promises strike ranges of up to 10,400 kilometers, enough to hit the west coast of the United States. On the other hand, the Hwasong-15 is a kind of evolution of the previous model that is still under development and has only been tested once. So it is suspected that we could see ballistic tests of this missile in the near future. The communist regime regime wants this missile, also two-stage, to be able to strike almost anywhere in the world with a range of up to 13,000 kilometers. That's over 8,000 miles. But not only that, other missiles, like the new Hwasong-17, also promise to be one of the key pieces of the ballistic missile program in the future. However, this one is still in a fairly early stage of its development. Now, by now, you may be wondering, but let's see, how on earth can the North Koreans test the range of these intercontinental missiles when the country is so small? Well, actually, that's a good question, because North Korea has an exclusive economic zone that extends, at most, up to some 1,000 kilometers, or 620 miles from its farthest coast. But of course, we're talking about North Korea. It's not as if they're too concerned about the minutia of what some people call international law. The fact is that the missiles fall within Japan's exclusive economic zone is something that Pyongyang doesn't really care about. So, problem solved. <laughs> In any case, in order not to provoke more outrage than necessary, what they usually do is to test the missiles upside down. Wait, what do you mean? Upside down? Yeah, you heard right, upside down. What they do is launch the missiles high instead of long. And then, with complex calculations, they obtain what the range of the missile would have been had it been launched on a normal ballistic trajectory of attack. Take a look at this infographic. What you see is the trajectory of missiles in three ballistic tests conducted in July and November 2017, the latter corresponding to the Hwasong-15 missile. As you can see, what the North Koreans do is launch intercontinental missiles to extremely high altitudes of up to 4,500 kilometers high. That's 2,765 miles. Yes, they launch the missiles into the exosphere, and after re-entering the dense atmosphere, they fall into the sea. So this is not a bluff. North Korea has proven missiles capable of reaching US territory, and that is of particular concern if, in the end, as we've already told you, the North Koreans manage to miniaturize and mount nuclear warheads on these missiles. So then the question becomes, how on earth can this situation be avoided? Could the North Korean nuclear and ballistic program be stopped at this point? Well, this is something that we will talk about in a future video here on Visual Politic. The questions are now over to you. What actions would you take to avert this danger? How do you think the North Korean problem should be handled? More importantly, do you really believe that all this offensive power poses a real risk? Leave us your comments below and let's open a debate. And now, if you found this video interesting, please like and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. As always, thank you very much for watching. All the best. See you next time.